Um, okay, welcome to our welcome to our lunch. We have a um, we have kind of a novel approach. We have one, two, three, four, five uh, CEOs of technology companies representing north of ten billion dollars in market value, <laughs> market capitalization. I, I I had hoped to have a more precise figure for you, um, but Keith Crock of, of of DocuSign wouldn't wouldn't play ball with me. So uh, that that's as that's as good as I'm going to do. But my point is is that if you think about the um, if you think about the people up on stage with me, um, we don't have these are not uh, these are not tiny startup companies, and these are not the mega cap, uh, you know, Google type size companies either. So, you know, at the I would say that the companies sitting on this stage are right in the heart of the you know the talent challenge, the talent hunt, and so I think we have a lot to learn from these CEOs. I'm going to do what we do with our other panels only try to involve all of you more. We'll have a little conversation up here. We'll try to take everybody's pulse uh, on this subject and then get as many questions as we can from you. I'd appreciate it if at the beginning our questions focus on the subject that we're here to talk about. And after that, if you want to take this opportunity to ask them about their businesses or their, you know, their thoughts about the, the situation in Egypt, um, feel, free, <laughs> feel free to do that as well. So, uh, let, me, let me briefly introduce everybody. Brad Garlinghouse, uh, a, a veteran of Yahoo, the CEO of uh, Hightail, formerly known as You Send It. Next to him, Blake Irving, a veteran of Microsoft, also of Yahoo, the CEO of GoDaddy. Do I say GoDaddy or GoDaddy.com? How do you? GoDaddy. GoDaddy. Uh, next to him, Zach, Zach Nelson, the CEO of NetSuite. Uh, a veteran earlier in his career of McAfee and Oracle. Dave Goldberg, the CEO of SurveyMonkey, uh, also a Yahoo veteran, <laughs> and, other, and, and other things. And finally, Keith Kroc, CEO of DocuSign, uh, formerly the CEO of, of a very successful and, and, and large software company, Ariba, who, uh, who, who came out of retirement a couple years, a couple years ago, is that right? Yeah. Uh, for, for a new challenge. Okay, the premise of our, of our conversation is that, you know, for years, the CEO had a variety of functions and the company had a head of human resources. The human, head of human resources handled all the functions that you would expect with talent, rec recruitment, hiring, firing, evaluation, um, and so on. In the technology industry, talent has become so critical that it's job number one for the CEO. Some of you are going to agree with that. Some of you are going to disagree with that. I'm going to start with you, Keith, and ask you the, you know, a, a sort of a quantitative question, which is, how much time do you spend on issues that we would all agree are HR related, and why do you spend so much time doing that? Yeah, I would say probably somewhere between 30 and 40 percent. Mm -hmm. You know, the way I look at it is the most important role of the CEO is to build a high-performance team. Um, you know, the first step is getting the best talent you possibly can. The company with the best people wins. And then the second thing is get everybody working together as a team. So uh, it, it's a big, big part of my, uh, you know, what I do every single day. And if you spend 30 to 40 percent on HR functions, then there's things that you're not spending time on. What are those things? Details. <laughs> do an email. Um, <laughs> spend a lot of time with customers. You know, I spend a lot of time with... Uh, our leadership team from a strategy perspective. Um, so but, anything, anything that really gets, gets down in the weeds. But you're, the impl are things that you're delegating? Absolutely. Okay, so but you're, you're, the implication, if you're spending 30, 40% on talent issues, that's something you're choosing not to delegate, at least not initially, is that correct? That's, that's absolutely correct. So you know, the time I, I, I spend on that, um, I, I always have at least one or two direct uh, positions I'm recruiting for. Mm -hmm. I'll interview anybody at the VP or senior director level, uh, new board members, advisory board members. I do all my own reference checks. Uh, our chief revenue officer here always kids me about that, Neil Hudsbeth. When, when we were hiring him, I did eight reference checks on him. And, and, and you know, the great byproduct of that is that when uh, this guy comes into the company, I know a lot about him. I know how to work with him. I know he doesn't like to be micromanaged. Um, and, and then a lot of the references that I talk to, I go, hey, do you know about DocuSign? Let me yeah, tell you right. about it. Right. And uh, it's probably one of the greatest customer uh, yeah. 
you know, opportunity. I so. was thinking that if you, if you do eight reference checks, it's an opportunity to network and talk to people. All right, Absolutely. I'm going to ask each of you the same question and elaborate on it however you like. What, what percentage of your time, Dave, do you spend on, on these kinds of issues? I, I think it's probably about the same, so about, you know, 30%. I, it was, so it was 100%. Uh, because I joined SurveyMonkey about four and a half years ago. We had 12 people in Portland, seven of whom were customer support, and I needed to really build out the entire team. And so in the beginning, literally, it was just me in, in a small office in Menlo Park, and I needed... That sounds very lonely. It was, it was lonely. <laughs> and so I did everything, and not just HR, but, right. but most of my focus... So I've gone from 100% down to 30, I would say, but I was mostly recruiting, right? And... Um, uh, how, yeah. many, how many people is Survey Monkey now, and how many will you hire this year, approximately? We're about 240 right now. We hi we'll probably have 70 or 80 hires this year. And Keith, I forgot to ask you the same question. So we've got about uh, 450 people in the company. About a year and a half ago, we were at 150, and we'll continue to hire actually as fast as we can. Zach? Uh, yeah, when I started, we had about 50 people. Today, we have about 2,500, and we'll add 1,000 this year or so. You know, I think when you look at, I think everybody probably spends the same amount of time on HR, but what changes is what you're doing right. when you're a 50-person company and when you're a 2,500-person company. And, mm -hmm. you know, my experience has been when you're, when you're in the 50-person company, you sort of see HR as a necessary evil. It's that overhead, it's that burden of processes you have to put in place to get people on board. Why can't we just get to work? Mm. Uh, and, you know, I've sort of evolved in my view of HR now that we're a 2,600-person company. It's like the most important function. It is a strategic function. You know, if you talk to HR professionals, they all want to be strategic mm -hmm. to the CEO. And it wasn't really until the last two years I figured out what that meant. Um, and so I'm still spending 30 to 40 percent of my time, but it's a, a very different 30 to 40 percent because I can't reach out and touch as much as I'd like to every, 20, every one of the 2,600 employees. And frankly, they don't want to be touched. It scares the hell out of them now when, a, when the CEO comes down and touches a frontline manager. You know, something's wrong. Something, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, when in the old days, you know, I'd pick up the phone and call anybody. And so I, I sort of, you know, I've been gotten very philosophical about HR as I've gone through the journey of, of building the company. And uh, it's, it's pretty amazing how, how your view of managing a business changes and how you have to deal with people change as the company grows. Blake, so, you're much newer in your position than I think anyone else on the I'm, I'm sure stage. I am. So I'm, I've been at GoDaddy only since January, so that's you know, six, seven months of time and seat. And when you, when you enter a company that has been um, owner-run, owner-operated for, <laughs> for 10, 15 years, uh, has 3,500 employees already and 1.4 billion in revenue, it's, it's, it's not a startup. But transforming that company into a more value-based, thoughtful company from a company that operated almost solely in, in the Arizona area. And what, what I've been doing, and actually one of the, one of the keys for me, I, I went from 100% of my time before I started. So before I started, I was recruiting it, uh, folks into the company just because the story was so powerful on what had happened there, how much revenue had been generated, and how many things had been done in very untraditional ways. So starting to actually talk to my network and tar get my fingers out into the companies that I've worked with and wh where those folks have gone over time. It was you know, almost 100% recruiting. That's now flipped over the last six months to be probably, I'd say 30% is still the time that I spend on HR uh, function. It's a generally around the same area, Pr pretty, pretty rough, but about that. Now I'm actually spending a lot of time on, on building a culture, creating a mission and a vision and a strategy that people can get behind and say, oh, I, I know where we're going in five years, not next week, but five years from now, and I know what we want to be when we grow up. So you end up being a culture carrier, somebody who's a sounding board, somebody who is touching people as, frankly, as deep as I can get to the front line without freaking people out, because it, it is kind of a weird thing when your CEO you know, sends, I send mail to people and I do skip level one-on-ones where I'll send mail to folks throughout the company and say, I just want to meet with you and just tell me what's going on. This, we'll have lunch. Um, and they're initially freaked out and then by the end of the hour, they were having a good time. They got to talk. They got to talk about problems. They got to talk about the cultural attributes on top of the table and all the things that are underneath it that they don't like. So you mentioned culture. I'd like to suggest a very quick role-playing uh, uh, um, exercise between the two of you. You're Blake Irving, the new CEO of GoDaddy. You call me as a prospective hire, and you say, hi, I'd like you to come work at GoDaddy. Yeah. And I say, isn't that that company with, uh, you know, with, the, with, the, with the scantily clad girls on the television commercials? And you know, I'm a family, man. That, that really doesn't reflect my values. You know, absolutely. 
Uh, I got to tell you, when, when I was called by, um, by, the, by the guys who bought the company, which was KKR, Silver Lake, and TCV, like, I, I, was, I had the same comment, GoDaddy. I, I've been a customer. I have 54 domains hosted at GoDaddy. I know exactly what they're about. Turns out I didn't. And as soon as I got the book that said, this is what these guys actually do, and this is what we think the assets are, it was immediately clear to me that this could be the largest front door for tiny businesses in the world. In fact, is when somebody has an idea and they say, God, I want to have a business, the first thing they do is they register a domain. And now, how easy you make it for them to get a website, to get found, to get uh, the ability to market to their customers, to acquire customers, retain customers, and then to help them run their back office. Like, and these guys did it. Not, not super, super well. I mean, they did it incredibly well in terms of acquiring customers, but the, the product discipline wasn't what you'd find at, you know, a best-in-class company in the Bay Area. Yep. And as soon as you tell people the size of the company, you also throw in that we're privately held. Yep. Right? And that that's, a, that's kind of a, a really interesting thing. And that the, the investors want to turn this into a giant company. We're privately held is a euphemism for you're going to get stock options that may be valuable one day in an IPO, correct? Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, and, and so um, what's interesting, I think uh, unintentionally, the four private companies here are, all are in some version of a turnaround situation or recapitalization, you could, whatever the buzzwords are. But, but uh, Hightails, when you joined, Brad, definitely you viewed it as a turnaround situation, correct? And I want to know how you communicate that in the, in the, in the talent hunt. So I, I would say I spend well over 50% of my time on HR. And I think as Dave Goldberg... Whoa, well over 50. Yeah. All right. and, I, and I would even actually challenge these guys. I bet actually if I really peeled the onion back, these guys are higher. Because I think all of us at the end of the day are also the chief cultural officer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you know, the, the CEO and the leadership team at the CEO level, I think, dictates and you know, we exude the culture the whole organization should have. And that's part of it. Uh, but I also agree with the kind of you know, reaching out to people you know, I was leaving late from the office last week, and it happened to be there's a game of beer pong going on, and it's amazing what you can learn about what's going on at your company for 45 minutes over beer pong, uh, <laughs> as one small example. But you know, I, I would position you know the company <laughs> formerly you send it, it, you know, it's a company that has been on a great trajectory, but known for one small piece of what we do, and I think what we have been in the market selling today to small businesses, large businesses, is very different than that. Impetus, and so the turnaround part is really you know the rebrand as you know just recently now Hightail, which I think is a much better uh, encapsulation of kind of where we're headed. Dave, you've been very public about the fact one of the reasons you did a, a, a public financing recently, but you didn't you did not go public, you did not do an IPO, but you didn't uh, make any uh, you you weren't hiding the fact that this was also an opportunity to um, get some liquidity into the hands of employees. And so what, I, what I'd like to hear from each of you is the, to your own take on this issue of where do we stand today? How important is you know, stock option wealth to, the, to talent in the Valley? And for the sake of argument, I'm not focused on your top five or 10 executives. I'm talking about everybody else. Um, you know, I, I, think, I think it varies by the kind of company, the stage of life the employee base is in. Um, we find still, as much as we try, that our employees don't understand stock options. Uh, you do a lot of explaining, a lot of, it's, it's something they think they should have, but when you get down to it, if you give people, you know, more in quantity, even if it's less as a percentage of the company, they're happier, right? I mean, just the, the math is, <laughs> They understand it when they make money on it. They understand when they <laughs> make money. Then they figure it out and real so fast. I, I would say we did not do, we did a, this recap. We raised $800 million, and it all went to investors and employees. It didn't go into the company. Um, we, we had sort of a couple of purposes with that, but the, the money we wanted to get to the employees was less about the employees demanding, I need cash for my stock options. It really wasn't. They, most employees had only been at the company a couple of years, as I mentioned. So. It, but what it was for that employee base was an opportunity to sell a portion of their holdings, not all. We didn't want to let people sell all of their stock. But that made it more tangible. That made it more not theoretical. It, it, it was like, wow, I got real value for this. Yep. So then it's, it's sort of like the future options we give them and new employees you bring in. It, it, it has value. So that, that was a big part of it. Keith, uh, Ariba was one, of the, was one of these moonshot internet era stocks where the stock went up so much, so fast, so many employees 
I assume if they had the presence of mind to sell, made a ton of money. Would you tell, tell me how your thinking on this subject has evolved and do the compare and contrast with me, if you yeah. will, between being the CEO of Ariba on the one hand yeah. back then and the CEO of DocuSign now? Yeah, you know, in the Ariba days, um, it was so much wealth creation. Could you remind us of some metrics that I'm sure you <laughs> remember, which I don't remember? So we, uh, we came out uh, of an IPO. I think it was, we priced it 19. The end of the first day, it went up to 98. I think it was like 5 billion. Um, and by the way, we were cash flow positive all the way through. We, were, we doubled revenues quarter over quarter for 12 quarters in a, in a row. Uh, and the stock went up to 34 billion. Uh, on the day it went public, we had probably 500 people in the company. Everybody became, you know, millionaires, the secretaries. I mean, everybody. We went through a 64, 64 to one stock split, um, ultimately. So a tremendous amount of wealth creation. And the interesting thing for me, it really was a study in human nature. Yeah. Because you always wonder, well, how would this individual take this, being, you know, just worth so much money? And, and, you know, it kind of de uh, defied the laws of physics. I mean, some cases didn't affect people at all. And they hmm. just kind of went about the, in other cases, it's like, hey, man, I'm just going to the beach. Um, <laughs> and so, it, you know, it, it is a real study in human nature. So the question is, um, you know, all these companies successful, and there's been a lot of wealth uh, creation. So how do, you, how do you keep all these employees motivated after uh, a liquidity event like that. And I've, I think it really comes down to, uh, I think, really three things. I think it's the culture um, and um, everything that goes with it. Uh, the second thing is, I think it's uh, going out there and competing and, and winning um, and moving on and, the, and keeping the growth going. And then I think the third thing is um, uh, friendships and relationships. Yeah. Zach, I know you give a lot of thought to the, to, to the sort of um, level of maturity of your company, the fact that you've been a public company for quite a few years now, and that is a different profile. So c c talk about how you confront this issue with your employee base. Yeah, well, we've always felt stock compensation was an important part of the company, and you know, part of the way we've, cha we've solved the challenge of hiring 1,000 employees uh, a year is we actually built a distributed company from the very beginning. So our headquarters in San Mateo only has... 300 people. We have, you know, 300 people in the Czech Republic. We have 600 people in the Philippines. So we've built this distributed company. And one of the things that we were adamant about was making sure that every one of those employees also got stock. And, you know, frankly, when we would start, the most important person that you hire or the most, most important people you hire when you go globally are the first three or four people. So we would give those guys what we called founder stock. It was like, you're the founding team of the Czech Republic. You're the founding team in Manila. And again, they could care less. Oh, whatever. But now it's like, oh, we have, this is actually good, you know. So they figure it out after they make money. Um, and, and so it's, that, it's a positive unifying force, but to Keith's point, once you do have sort of a great run like NetSuite's had, then, you know, you're afraid your employees are hiding under the desk vesting, you know. <laughs> yep. And that's not what you want. You want people taking the same risks and moving the ball forward in the same way. So it comes back to making sure that when you hire these people, you know, they're signed up for the vision, they're excited about the kind of things you're doing for customers because that's really what they have to be excited about. Not the making money, everybody gets excited about making money, but when you make it, what keeps you engaged? And so the, f the, the people you hire is more important, frankly, than the way you compensate them, although we compensate them well. Blake and Brad, I wanna ask each of you, first you Blake and then you Brad, would you, your new CEO, um, new CEOs want their own team, they, it's a good opportunity candidly to fire the people who are underperformers or who, who aren't the right people. Talk about how you do that, first of all, if you've done it. I know, Brett, I know you've, had, you've let a fair number of people go, or you've changed out your team, I should, was a, is a kinder way of putting it. <laughs> I don't know about a GoDaddy. So talk about that and what that, how that affects the morale of the company and also how it affects recruiting. Can I talk about stock options and stuff? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we got enough of that, I think. <laughs> all right. Uh, I have made a, a significant number of, of hires, so I think probably 80% of my direct reports are new, but it's a, it's a, it's a different uh, situation because I've got the ability to hire a lot of incremental employees that can then go in and start assessing what the talent base looks like. Right? And we know that we have some talent shift to make from customer care and marketing and uh, operations to really good disciplined product development, which we haven't had. So, a lot of the folks that I've been hiring are 
you know, pr product people from Google, Yahoo, eBay, uh, Cisco in some cases, Microsoft been, been a big place. And we've actually uh, just acquired 40,000 square feet in Mountain View, uh, Sunnyvale area, another 10,000 up, uh, up in Redmond to acquire uh, new employees that aren't you know, trading out or getting rid of employees that are there, but are actually trying to help show them the way. Right? And trying to say, look, you guys are probably pretty good, but let's, let's go ahead and we're going we're gonna to try to bring you along for the ride. So globalization, uh, f flat platform, better user experience, all the things that you can actually make observations if you just go up to the site that we need. We're hiring folks to go do that. And, and they just didn't have the talent to do it. Right? Even some of the business mechanics of you know, preparing a company to go public, you have to hire new people to go do that. That doesn't mean you've actually got to get rid of everybody in the company, which I think is what the fear of a lot of folks in the company are. And I had a lot of people, you know, I ask two questions in every meeting that I have with folks is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm new, I'm the new CEO, what do you hope I do and what are you afraid I'll do? And the, the, the hope is like, I hope you turn us into a product company because we know that our products aren't as good as they ought to be when we're on the customer care lines. People complain about them bitterly. They don't, they don't work as well as we wish they did. Some of them work really well and some of them don't. Domain's best in the business by far. Hosting, not as good as it could be. Mm. Some of the other things, not as good as it could be. We want to improve that. And, so, by, and by the way, uh, you know, have you had to deal with the um, conventional, everyone in the, uh, employees everywhere are not thrilled when they find out that their company is owned by private equity firms. You, you uh, know, the, the how have you dealt with that? Private equity is, is interesting. There's a, KKR, Silver Lake, and TCV have all been magnificent investors in the company. And I think when people think of private equity, it's like, okay, here comes private equity. They're about to invest and then pull a bunch of money out of it. And it, the ac absolute that's what they do. That's what they do. Absolute <laughs> opposite. The absolute opposite is what's going on, right? These guys actually want to grow the company. They know what the opportunity looks like. They, wouldn't, they would have brought in a totally different guy if they said, let's go ahead and just instrument this thing and start crafting it for sell-off. You know, they're, they're trying to get this company in position for liftoff, not sell-off. I understand. And, and, and so that and you tell is, the employees that and they, and well, they, they buy they, it? Well, they were, <laughs> frankly, there were, I, I talked to a whole to bunch of clear, guys. To be clear, I am not, I'm, I'm just having, You're okay, not I biased believe, in any way. No, no, I actually, <laughs> I actually know the history of these companies in technology companies and I buy it. But well, so <laughs> before I got there, they were, there, there was a little bit of like, oh, crap, you know, we're, we're held by private equity. What does that mean? And then when I came on board and people actually, you know, I think everybody in the company hit my LinkedIn profile um, and just to find out what I had done. And I build stuff like that. That's what I do, right? And I've got a history of building things and growing businesses <clears throat> and starting from very few customers to, you know, hundreds of millions of them. And that, that's what I like to do. So I'm like, well, this is totally different than what we thought might happen. Mm -hmm. So there, there became a better comfort mm -hmm. in what Silver Lake TCV and KKR intended to do with the company. And now I've actually even ha hired the interim CEO who was running the company before I hired, left KKR, joined the company as the CFO and the COO, hmm. which is yeah. like, this is all about growth. This isn't about trying to trim the company and, and sell it off. This is about going public in a bigger way. You've had all this time to stew about the question about the people you've fired. I thought fired, you were going to get different questions. No, no, I, I haven't forgotten. But I, <laughs> I want to point out, we, we glossed over something that you said, Brad. You, you, gave, I think you gave like a new paradigm on, on managing earlier when you talked about you know, the, the beer pong uh, effect. You know, my, my daughter's not old enough, but I know that uh, people with older children love to, you know, just like drive them and their friends or, or listen, to, totally. listen to the conversation. I think it's different because they learn things. Oh, but you're, playing, you're, playing, you're suggesting by playing beer pong, you can find out what's going on at the company. <laughs> they didn't believe me that I'd never played because the first shot I took went in. <laughs> <laughs> wow, he's good. All right, so. Uh, listen, you know, I think that both Blake and I, you know, we inherited something that had a lot of greatness to it. And so a lot of good people had built something, but also, you know, probably an opportunity to take it to the next level. And so, yeah, I've made a, a bunch of changes. And I think at the end of the day, you know, even kind of segueing back to some of the stock-based comp, if I'm interviewing someone and the first thing they want to talk about is, you know, stock and these things, I, I want to hire people who believe in what we're trying to do. I think that the, the best employees that go through what Keith has led people through at Ariba, those are the people who believe in something bigger than themselves. And they want to be a part of that. You know, there's a Steve Jobs-ism of, I want to, make a small dent in the universe. And I think particularly in Silicon Valley, but also in lots of other entrepreneurial communities, you, that's what people want to be a part of. And I think when you're recruiting people, uh, you know, stock-based comp and you know, cash comp is necessary, but not sufficient for at least the kind of employees and the kind of culture we want to build. 
just because, you know, I'm just not a nice person. How early in your conversation with the board of, of you send it with the VCs did the question of your compensation package come up? <laughs> you know, the person who uh, had that first conversation is in this room. And Who's so that? Uh, uh, Nick Sturiali, I saw a minute ago. I don't know where he oh, There he is over there. <laughs> so, uh, you know, <laughs> Nick could answer that better than I could. I don't remember. But Oh, you remember. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I, and I will say very genuinely, if I didn't believe in what the company was trying to do, I wouldn't have done it. Like, there's an old saying, like, it, the first day you're driving to work and you're like, what the hell am I doing? Like, turn around. <laughs> it's not worth it. There's a lot of other cool stuff going on. And I say that to my employees. Yeah, I, Some of them are here who can yeah, argue with that. I just, I just want to add to what Brad said. I mean, I think this is the most important thing is, like, you've got you've to build an, a, uh, an approach where people feel like this is their company. Right. And they own it, and, and Blake mentions too. Like, and and you. So what we've done, kind of on the HR side, is like the HR stuff needs to follow from that. A lot of the HR policies that traditional big companies have are like to keep control of the employee base. Like mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's to like it goes back to the industrial age. You got to make sure <laughs> that people were like doing their piecemeal job on the on the on the line, and that's not the employees we're hiring today. Mm -hmm. right? And so I think. You know, I think a lot of companies here, like we take the approach, like, you know, we're going to give our employees a lot of responsibility. Uh, you, Zach mentioned self-managed team. I mean, you, 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 we have to do that. We can't hire people who are automatons and tell them, do this, do this, do this. we got to hire really talented people and give them a lot of responsibility. And so that has to go through the HR processes. So we've, we've taken, you know, a lot from what Reed Hastings has done at Netflix. Like, we don't have a vacation policy. Take as much vacation as you want as long as you get your job done, right? You know, we... We have, have small, you, How long have you had that policy in place? Three months after I started. And are there, are there abusers? You know, we, we have, there's certain functions where everybody can't decide we're all going on vacation this week, right? Uh -huh, uh -huh. You, so you have to, we have to manage the time in which people do it. But no, actually, the bigger problem is some people don't take enough vacation. You actually right. kind of have to get people to, to do it. Um, totally but you've you, you got to just give people responsibility and see what they do with it and let them fail, but not fail repeatedly. And I think that's the most important thing for the kind of companies we're building. I want to ask you all about a, a, a trend that's become very buzzy in the last year or so, partly because of, not partly but not exclusively, because of uh, Peter Thiel, which is uh, you know, encouraging kids to, not, to drop out of college or not even to go to college and instead to become entrepreneurs or go straight into the workforce. How do you feel, how do you feel about that? Anyone? I, just go last ahead. week, I got an employee on our team named Caroline and the marketing team, young woman, very, very, very talented, and said, hey, should I think about going back to business school? And we had a really open, honest conversation about the pros and cons of that. And she'd been a Princeton undergrad. She's done a fabulous job at Hightail. And I was like, listen, you know, here was my experience. You I, went to business school. I did. But I, the difference, in my opinion, was I went to the University of Kansas. And frankly, as much as I loved the University of Kansas, I'd never heard of McKinsey. I'd never heard of BCG. Like, those things didn't exist. You know, going to Princeton is a slightly different experience. And I, the point I made to her is, I don't think it is totally necessary. And I think depending upon what your skill sets are, I think there's lots of very successful dropout stories. So a slightly a, different I, question of going to business school versus going to college right. at all. I, Go ahead, I, I, so I have a, I have a 19-year-old kid in college. And, and I, I, I reflect back on my college experience, and I learned a lot of things in class, and I learned a shitload of things outside of class. <laughs> um, and I'm not sure which were more important than reflection. And I know now reliving that experience through a 19-year-old kid who's extremely bright, it's in the UC system, doing really well, and a lot of what he's learning, he's learning outside of class from other guys that he's hanging out with, and he's doing entrepreneurial things, and I actually want to see him complete a degree so he can say, like, I finished something, and that, that feels really good. Now, if, if he comes up with an idea and, and comes off the charts and does some crazy entrepreneurial thing, which he's come up, a couple, come up with a couple of those things and registered his domains with GoDaddy, um, <laughs> Uh, you know, if, if he comes up with something great, but yeah. frankly, I, I'd really like to see him have the whole experience. Yeah. Keith? I, I think this is interesting. Last Friday, I was looking at it from the other angle. Uh, I was chairman of the board of trustees of Purdue, and we asked this question because all this online uh, education, everything's coming. So it's like, how do, we, how do we look at this as Purdue University? How do we look at this um, as tr trustees, and how do we... Uh, get these students engaged. And the, and the conclusion that we came to is, hey, maybe some of these guys, they don't belong at school. They should just go. But the point is, the most important thing, you know, of uh, residential college experience is what you learn, you know, outside the classroom and all the leadership and service and, 
and all that kind of stuff. But, um, uh, and, and we brought up Peter Thiel's name because the first entrepreneur, they pulled out one of our brightest students at Purdue and, you know, and he had an incredible experience, but then he, made, he had to make a promise to his parents that he would go back. But, Interesting. Um, yeah, it's a challenge. Questions from all of you, please. Right in the center, John Krim, there's a mic coming to you. I think, I think by the way, I think Mark Zuckerberg and Sergey Brin's parents are still expecting them to go back. <laughs> <laughs> you might have inside knowledge on that. <laughs> Sergey Brin, what you mean for his PhD. Yeah. His PhD, but Mark's undergrad. Yeah. 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 Uh, with all of the... I'm sorry, just tell everybody who you are, please. Jonathan Krim, Wall Street Journal, sorry. With all of the attention you all put on HR, um, didn't hear any real <laughs> discussion of mentoring, and in particular, I'm curious why you think there are so few women still in senior executive positions in the Valley and what you're doing about it. And Dave, you should probably go last. <laughs> <laughs> not allowed to comment. Yeah. I, I personally think mentoring is very difficult. It, my, my experience has been very difficult in high technology, primarily driven by the fact that everything changes so rapidly in the technology space. You know, the number of times, there is, as Dave was saying, you know, you're not doing piecemeal work on the line. Things are changing all the time. They're really, when people come and ask me, what's my career path? I'm like, I have no idea. You know, you sort of have to make your own way in the world. Now you can provide people guidance, but this whole concept of, of a CEO or even your manager really being able to give you a career path, I've never really seen work out well in, in people that want to advance their career. I, I think everybody sitting at this table, nobody ever told them what their career path was going to be. You basically yeah, but I, I, I might you, see, you see opportunity and then you, know, you see a snake and you kill a snake, right? Because I mean, <laughs> as a CEO, I can't see all the snakes to kill. Yeah. But you always advance the people that find snakes and kill them for you. You know, I, 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 might, I, might, I might disagree just a little <laughs> bit. So I, I have, uh, I, I've mentored a lot of people across a bunch of industries. I didn't have to be the CEO to do it. You said to have enough, enough uh, battle scars and made some good decisions and some bad ones, which are almost more important, to be able to give that kind of counsel. And um, I've actually, per personally, be because of the death of my family and when my sister passed away, it was a, became a sort of a personal quest of mine to start forwarding women in technology. And I, people think, of like, well, you're a GoDaddy. You know, that, that's kind of the inverse, <laughs> isn't it? Um, and I've actually been very demonstrative when I've been in the company. My last senior hire, my CTO, is a woman that I hired from Yahoo, Alyssa Murphy. And I started mentoring Alyssa, first time she'd ever worked directly for me. Uh, and I started mentoring her uh, in early in her career at Microsoft and then uh, brought her to Yahoo to work for somebody else and continue to mentor her. And I'm active in the Society of Women Engineers and also um, in, in uh, the Grace Hopper Foundation and have funded a couple teams from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, which is where I live, uh, to go to that conference. So I, I think actually giving enough of yourself to, to, to even though I'm not gender uh, you know, I'm not gender appropriate to be you know, counseling somebody who's a female, uh, you know, it doesn't matter. Right? The things that you've learned are, are generic and are androgynous, and so those kind of learnings that you can actually pass on to people, regardless of gender, are very important, Why regardless of CEO. Why? Why are there so few? Well, have you, I don't know if you've actually yeah. done the math on matriculation out of college, yeah, but yeah, it, I, it's, I, it's, I, it's I incredibly do. difficult even to matriculate Go ahead, Keith. folks yeah, out. I, I, think it, I think it goes back to uh, uh, education, higher education, and trying to recruit women into the STEM disciplines. That's a big thing exactly. we struggle with at, at Purdue, Lar largest engineering school in the country. The uh, male to female ratio is probably about, uh, it's 80% men. Yeah. And well, so we're asking ourselves that question all the time. Our Dean of Engineering is a great role model, Leah Jameson, I, but it's something to struggle with. And I think it actually goes back to K through 12, and that is how do we get you know, our, our, our daughters interested in the STEM discipline. So, Go ahead, Brad. I, I mean, a slightly more simplistic <laughs> oh, answer. Oh, you're going to get your chance. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> give you the big clothes. A slightly more simplistic answer, I think why we haven't seen that yet is because I think we have more role models today who are in women in leadership positions than we've had before in Silicon Valley. And I'm pointing to people like Sheryl Sandberg and Marissa Mayer, but even more broad than that. And I think, I think this will change more material in the next five to 10 years. The, the other thing I'll just quickly say about this I think we all as leaders can speak volumes about that in terms of how we manage our teams, how we manage our staffs. And I think the people who know me well and know my team well will say that there are women on my team who have a stronger voice than anyone else, despite the role they might specifically play more narrowly. And I think that says, that speaks to the culture of our organization. And I hope that we will continue to see women 
like this woman I talked to from marketing last week, want to step up and have more and more responsibility. But I think the role models that we're seeing more and more in Silicon Valley will have an impact in the years to come. And, and just in case there's anyone in the room who doesn't know why we're chuckling uh, uh, up here, is that, uh, obviously most, most people know that Dave Goldberg is married to Sheryl Sandberg. And I was gonna say, maybe the situation is what it is because her book has only been out for several months. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I think, look, Cheryl's trying to change the dialogue and cr create a lot of things, and particularly, you know, we see it in technology. I mean, I, I would say everything everyone said is, is definitely part of the issues. The pipeline is an issue. Um, I, I guess I'll just talk about something different. So we have 40% of my senior team is women. This is not because of my wife. Um, this is, um, it, it, I think you have to create a work environment where you can hire and retain both men and women who want to have a great job, but also want to have a life. And so I would say the average age of the people I recruited is older than some other companies in similar positions. And we were able to do that because of the kind of business we have. We don't have salespeople. Um, you're not dealing with clients at strange hours and th those kind of things. So not every company can do this, but we were able to say to people, look, this is, you know, you know, be in the office nine to, six, nine to five, 30, you know, you do some work at nights and the weekends, but this is like a, this is a career where you can have a life and, um, and, and have a, a very fulfilling job. And so my, uh, I have two direct reports. One of them is a woman, she runs product engineering and design. And I was able to hire her because she was four months pregnant. She was about to go do her own startup. She found out she was pregnant. And I was able to talk her out of doing a startup, which she was certainly capable of doing. Uh, she was the founder of Evite when she was in college. She's more than capable of running her own company, but I was able to convince her that coming to work with me when she was pregnant with her first kid was a better thing than doing her own startup. So I think you, you kind of have to figure out how to make it work for people, and we have to do that both for men and women that want to have a family and a career. I think everyone would agree it's, a, it's an interesting and unique perspective we're, we're, he we're hearing this afternoon. <laughs> More questions? I know Mark Mahaney's in the room, so he's got to have a question. <laughs> no? Yeah, all the way in back. Hi guys, uh, David Kenny from the Weather Company. No, half of you. Um, trying to understand about culture, as you're trying to get these mission-driven companies, how you blend cultures when you've got engineers, creative people, artists and poets, folks who need the staff work. I find these cultures, and now I've got TV people, which are a different world altogether. Um, interested where you've dealt with bringing multiple cultures together and what advice you have on that? I'll take a swing, so. please. That we actually started with a vision, David. So we actually created a, a vision for the company. My first 100 days on the job, some very smart guys that were in the company already and weren't actually running the company but were thought leaders put together a vision and then a strategy. And we did this, this process called 22200, two page vision doc, 20 page sort of lower level document that would give to the board to say, this is what we're going to do. And then actual details on operating plan. And the vision was so was high enough level container and aspirational enough and inspirational enough to say we want to you know radically shift the global economy to enable people to you know run to grow to start and to run their business and it was so big that people just were like wow that's that's awesome we would like to be part of that culture and what's it going to take to do it and then you actually say it takes artists and engineers and poets and all these other people to fill out the culture. And we actually allowed them to say, tell us the words that you want to represent your culture from all these different places. And they just barraged us with words. And we took those words and refined them into a cultural statement that we now have in the company that represents this sort of um, grassroots mosh pit representation of what they wanted the company to look like. And that's the cultural statement now. And so it resonates with the customer care person on the floor uh, that's taking phone calls you know, on 24-7 shifts, uh, and the engineer who's, uh, who's thinking about architecture of you know, complex systems. And it's, uh, it's been awesome to see it actually, actually take root. Anyone else want to weigh in on that? You know, I think it goes back to uh, you know, what we would call our, our company playbook at DocuSign. So it's that noble mission, change the way uh, business is being done. But then it also goes back to you know your, your values in terms of what you stand for and celebrating different temperaments, talents, and convictions. And you know we s tell the sales guys you know put your put yourselves uh, you know don't make commitments you know to the customer that you can't keep 
tell the engineers, you know, put yourself in the customer's shoes and really kind of celebrate that. I mean, that's what really, made, that's what really makes it fun. Uh, David, do you want to share how you're, how you're doing uh, on this, this journey? Because your tenure is fairly short, right? It's 18 months, but I came here to get advice, so. <laughs> no, I understand. Um, no, listen, I, I, uh, I think what's been important is to give voice to the introverted part of the company. So when you've got c celebrities and bloggers and all that public-facing stuff, the scientists were buried, and the scientists were more introverted. Um, so it, it's not just similar from what Blake did, which was my digging around with the scientists, having them give me the words they wanted to use and then make, making people come back to them. I do think similar to the, you know, the gender thing we were talking about before, you gotta make sure that there are voices that aren't just hidden because they're introverted. Um, I would say the same thing was true with women, particularly minority women in our company, which I had to pull them out and go to, go to them and listen to them and bring their voices forward, so. That's great. Yeah, I, th I think, you know, all of us have the vision, values, mission thing. I think the, the challenge you face is how do you operationalize that in a company with structure that actually causes these groups to come together. And we were very fortunate at NetSuite very early on because our customers use our products to run multiple departments, multiple disciplines. It might be back office, front office, their website. We created a structure we call the cell structure that actually brings together the user classes of the website designer, the marketing person, the accounting person with our development teams. And that's really the core group that defines product roadmaps and whatnot. So I think if you can figure out ways to force cross-functional, cross-departmental structures into your company and have them be valuable for the customer ultimately, that's been incredibly successful for us. Uh, just one last thing I'd add. I think you also have to kind of live by whatever you decide those values are. And oftentimes where people see the disconnect is they see the values and you talk about them, but then you don't follow them. And so, you know, I think, you know, one of the examples I would have is like somebody who's a very high performer but is a cultural disaster. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you got to get rid of those people. You just can't. And it's like painful, and you're like, wow, this guy's our best sales guy, or this guy's our, one of our best engineers, but he's a jerk. Yeah, you got to get rid of those people because you can't say one thing and then let that happen. That's would that have... Um would that have been the? Would that have happened 20 years ago at Microsoft or Oracle? Would they have kept the jerk or gotten rid of the jerk? They kept them. Kept them. Fair, fair, also true, Zach. Name names. Uh, <laughs> I'm not asking. They, they ran me out of that place, so I don't I, know. Uh, I must say, they got rid of that. Jerk. <laughs> no, that, that's actually it's, a, it's actually a very important question because the the, the the culture, if it's like. You know, the, the, you can be an autonomous, independent cog that kicks ass and takes names, and by the way, is kicking everybody else's ass and, and pushing them away while he's having, you know, individual greatness. That does not build great companies in the end. It, I, it builds great individual contribution that polarizes. I'd say Oracle, you know, speaking about Oracle just in particular, they have a unique, have, historically, I haven't been there for ages, but they had a unique cultural structure where they would actually set up two competing groups to see who would do best. Yeah. And so there was this internal struggle often in big projects, which actually played out very well. And you look at a lot of the CEOs in the room, they're all ex-Oracle guys, you know. So uh, that, their cultural metaphor, at least at the time, was comp internal competition. And internal competition does not necessarily, does not necessarily equate to uh, bad behavior. Not yeah. necessarily bad behavior, but you know, it, it, yeah. can, it can lead to bad blood. <laughs> yeah. And, and I mean, people are, you know, com I competition is a, you know. Mark, thank you. Hand-to-hand -hand combat thing. Thanks, Adam. Uh, Mark Mahaney at RBC. I want to ask how you handle um, mercenary employee risk. And I say that in, a, in an environment where public markets are picking back up. We've had some interesting IPOs, a lot of acquisitions in the space. You've got to deal with employees who see all these major liquidity events, see friends or people that they know get rich quickly. How do you handle that risk and manage that? Like, Blake, you've got, you must have employees there are waiting for the IPO, and you wonder about how, how that could distort their you know, work ethic, yeah. et cetera. It's interesting. So the, the company when it was privately held, had a very, very tightly managed set of folks that had shares. Um, only in the last three months have we actually distributed shares to everybody in the company, mm -hmm. down to the customer care person on the floor. GoDaddy also once filed to go public, right? They did file to go public, and Bob pulled back, didn't, didn't like the market conditions, and said this doesn't make sense for us right now. Um, but, but so the, the, they had been through something like that before, but didn't, weren't going to actually share in it. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 don't, I have not yet had the pleasure of Keith's problem uh, look forward to that. Uh, <laughs> but, but it, you know, it, it is a, when you're sitting on top of something that is likely to have that, that type of outcome, um, it, it's not as big a problem for me because it's such a new concept to the company. Uh, and they, they're not, 
They're not looking at a, a, a lot of other companies that have popped um, that, that look like they're substantially going to be substantially bigger than ours. So it's just a different, I think, a different situation um, at GoDaddy right now. Yeah, I, I also think we all probably have stories of examples of either our own experiences or people that have worked for us that went job hopping trying to chase that next big one. And it, I mean, yes, there's a handful of success stories of when that worked, but there's a lot more stories of when it didn't work. Up, yeah. And I, you know, one of the pieces of advice I got from a mentor a long time ago is the idea that you know it's a marathon, not a sprint. And I think when I was 27, that was impossible to hear. <laughs> and now that I'm a little bit older, uh, I, it's the advice that I think is absolutely the right advice. It, it goes back to what we talked about earlier. Like, if, if you're just trying to do it for the money, I don't want to hire that person. Yeah. You, they have to believe in the vision and the mission of what you're trying to do, like to put your dent in the world. Before I ask my last question, does anybody have one more? Oh, you do. Go, please. Um, Keith, I found it fascinating that you're I'm doing sorry, all... I'm sorry, tell everybody who you are. I'm Ryan Smith from Qualtrics. I found it fascinating that you're doing all these uh, background checks yourself, personal references. I want to know from the rest of you what other tasks you don't delegate. Well, in my, in my case, I, I approve every sales and services hire in the company. I, what, I, what my experience has been is HR has evolved at NetSuite is first it's a necessary evil, then you delegate it all, and then you get really worried about the people you're bringing back in and you insert yourself in some way. And so, you know, I've inserted myself in the, the hiring process. And it's actually, you know, you don't necessarily want to micromanage, but there are some things you want to micromanage, and the quality of this group of people or that group of people is one of them. And my experience has been once I've started to approve or not approve these sales and services rec, you start to see the people being hired change in their profile. So uh, the funny thing, and going back in history when I worked at Oracle, when I worked at Oracle, Larry not only approved every rec, he interviewed everyone, and that was when it was a billion dollar company. And I thought that was just so extreme, I, I could never imagine it. But now being a CEO, I can totally imagine it. When you say every sales <laughs> and services hire, you mean down to a 22-year-old Everyone, but I, college I'm, I'm approving the offer, so I'm, I'm looking at the, all the resumes, I'm looking at the offer. The other thing I'm looking at is making sure our pay isn't getting out of whack. You know, as we grow, suddenly salaries begin to you know, grow like right. crazy. Right. So it's, a just, it's a great checkpoint, and you'll find different checkpoints for what you think are the important things in your company to insert yourself in the HR process so you make sure that's happening the way you want it to. Another example of the question was of something that you delegate? Pri prior you don't, delegate. Don't, delegate. Don't, don't delegate, excuse me. Pri prioritization of open recs. Like I, I go through every open rec in the company on a weekly basis with a team of about four people and make sure they're on priority with the things we think we need to get done. Interesting. Uh -huh. uh, and say, no, this guy just surfaced like two of them. No, we're not going to approve those. Those things are going to wait. We have some the replacement recs. And this is to your point about how you shift resources in the company of replacement recs. You don't think that's what's most important for you going forward, so you shift those recs into a different position. And so I actually micromanage that a little bit, and I micromanage our new employee orientation uh, program that we're just uh, putting together because it was not, uh, not what we think actually fits the culture and the vision that we've got now. And I'm sort of riding super hard on that, which is an unusual thing for a CEO. To yeah, so presumably you'll do that now if, if, if you're in this job five years from now, you probably won't be as involved in right. design of new employee orientation. I would hope not. I mean, I, I, I do a lot of the reference checks that Keith mentioned as well. Um, and I also think, like, I, my team sets a, we set a budget for the year, we approve it with the board, um, and they can, they can do their hiring and they can do all those sort of stuff within their budget. But the business changes over time. We see new things, we see new opportunities, we want to make changes to that. And that, I'm deeply involved in the changes, and why did we not see that ahead of time? Okay, there's good reasons, but I want to be pretty deeply involved in the changes, but I want to give them enough autonomy on the things we've decided up front. Yeah. Brad? I mean, I'll just echo some of the things. I think who you hire and who you fire says a tremendous amount about your company and what kind of culture you are, who you promote. And so those are things I would recommend any CEO not delegate. And it's something I approve every hire, I approve every offer. Uh, you know, before we fire anybody, you know, there's a discussion that I'm signing off on. Uh, because I think it just says an immense about immense amount about who you are as a company, uh, how you treat those things. And I, the employee orientation, I also echo, setting it up right. And whenever I'm in town on Monday morning, I'm going to the employee orientation, and I'm the one presenting, here's the big picture of who we're trying to be. Uh, I haven't necessarily met all the people who are in the room. And so it, I want them to hear from me what we're trying to do. Yep. Okay. I, I'll tell you another one that I, I don't delegate. Uh, although sometimes it gets, delegates, uh, it gets delegated in other areas in the company, and that is making the offer itself. Uh -huh. yeah. um, uh -huh. As opposed to a recruiter or the recruiting person or whoever it is, I just think that that's just so important to be able to say, 
you know, are you ready for an offer? Have you talked it over with your spouse? You know, because we don't want to go, hey, and, and it's an intelligence test. You got to docu-sign it right on the spot. <laughs> That's a good offer. Phone call or email, Keith? What's that? Phone, phone call or phone. email? Face to face. Oh, face to face. Face so, to face. So you have to ask them to come in for a, for a meeting. Absolutely. Got it. Yeah. So uh, it occurred to me uh, in wrapping that I started by talking about the combined market capitalization on stage. I should have talked about the combined number of years of management experience because we've got a lot of it here. I think we've had a lot of really good tips for managing and recruiting and, and, uh, and running companies. So um, to Brad, Blake, Zach, Dave, and Keith, thank you very much. And we have a short break and then we're into our <laughs> afternoon sessions. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Thanks.